Hello mechanical engineers, uh, Dr Foley here again. I'm going to continue our um, lectures on bolts uh, today um, and in particular we're going to look at bolts in tension and with preload. So without further ado and again hopefully you've looked at the PowerPoint lecture on preloading bolts but let's get started. So what we've got is a situation where we've got the bolt clamping typically two pieces of material together. So we've got our bolt here and then the bolt goes through the, through the two pieces of material and then there's a nut on the other side. So we have this situation. <clears throat> and what we do is when we um, we clamp these um, these two plates together, um, the idea is that we then keep tensioning or torquing the nut, and we effectively squeeze the the two pieces, clamp the two pieces of material together. And in doing that, we put these in compression, and the the part of the bolt that's between the nut head, um, between the nut and the, the bolt head, it goes into tension. So we have the situation in here where the material in the, the bolt is effectively in tension, FT, and if you think about the material, and this goes all the way around it, but the material itself in, is kind of being compressed, so it's in compression. So we have this FC here and this FT, and after we've tensioned the bolt up and there's no external loads applied, then obviously those two are equal and opposite. So whatever the, the bolt in tension force is equal to the compressive force that's in the material. So that's the um, the equilibrium position. Now you put this um, on top of the the cylinder head on your engine or on the um, the fire hydrant or whatever it is, and there's a fluid or there's some other external force is now applied that's trying to pull these two plates or these two two parts apart. So there's this external force here, Fe. And what that does, if you think about it, is as this tries to pull these two part parts away, and it can be applied obviously all the way around this thing, it's pulling these away, it's going to increase the tensile force Ft here. Um, but then as it does increase Ft, it stretches the bolt so the bolt moves a bit further. And what happens then is the two materials, because they're moved further apart, they're not in as much compression. So the compressive force here goes down. So eventually, um, when you've reached your new external force limit, the increase in the tensile force in the bolt is not exactly equal to however much, if you increase this by 10,000 pounds, say, you might find that the bolts only increase by 20% of that. Um, and the reason is that the the other 80% that would have occurred has effectively disappeared because that was already there in the form of this compressive force in the material and that's been alleviated. So what the material has lost in its force, um, the bolt does not see in terms of the increased external force. So just to summarize that, so as the external force Fe goes up, the force in the bolt, the tensile force in the bolt, we'll call that actually it's called the Fb force in the bolt, the force in the bolt also goes up, but the force due to the material, and again I'll call that M, sorry, I've got to be consistent here, the force in the material M, M goes down, okay? And the difference between the increase in this one and the decrease in this one means that this is less. So this goes up by 10,000, this drops by say 7, then this will only go up by 3. So what we've done by pre-stressing it is you effectively make the bolt, it, it does see an increase, but it only sees a fraction of the increase um, of the external load. Okay, so the bolt only sees a fraction, somewhere around 20 to 25% is ideal of the increase in the external load. And 
Why do we do that? Well, if you remember our um, stress and um, our fatigue analysis. So if you remember our fatigue equation, uh, equation, one over n equals the um, mean stress in the material over the yield stress, and then we had some factor k of the k star times the variable stress over the endurance limit. And what we found, okay, is that with our, um, like our fire hydrant or with our engine, this is a big, big factor in reducing our factor of safety. This variable stress can be a big, so we can reduce that way down. Okay, we increase this a small amount, but if you remember, the yield stress is much higher than the endurance stress. If we can uh, decrease the variable stress, then our fatigue life is going to be better. And that's what's happening here. The variable stress that the force is seeing in the bolt is um, is going down because of this uh, pre-loading that we're undertaking. So that's really the driving force behind it. So again, just look at the bolt in more detail. If we draw a graph here of the force in the bolt against the external load applied, then when we start off from, uh, from rest, we put some external load in here, our F0. And if there was no clamping material, there was no compressive force, then as we applied the external load, we would go up at a 45 degree angle because the bolt would see that. So this would be kind of a 45 degree angle because as you increase the external load, the bolt would see it all. But because of the preloading, we actually don't see um, this gradient, this, this, the force in the bolt is actually reduced by the force being released in the material. So we end up with something that actually does this. So our force, our actual force in the bolt is this, this line here. And the difference between these two, so the difference at any point here, is due to the unloading of the clamped material. So that's what you see. Uh, come a point when you've, you've exceeded the preload and now the bolt will see all of it. So then it will go up with at 45 degrees until eventually, and I'm sorry, I've kind of written on top of myself, until the, the bolt fails. But the idea is that we want to keep the material clamped. Usually we're sealing a liquid or a gas. So we try and operate in this region here. We make sure our external loads just move us up and down here and we never get to this point where we exceed the clamping and then ultimately the failing of the bolt. So that's the idea. This reduced gradient is what, what we're, 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 we're gaining by preloading the bolt. The absolute values are still increasing and still pretty high, but um, we are reducing the gradient, the fluctuations that the, the variable stress that the bolt will see. Okay, so what's the gradient of this? So the gradient this line well that's going to be a function of two things okay um, it's going to be a function of the stiffness of the bolt itself and the stiffness of the material it turns out the gradient of that line is this thing called C which we call the joint factor and that equals KB which is stiffness of the bolt over the stiffness of the bolt plus the stiffness of the material. So it's the fraction of the of the joints of the two stiffnesses, if you think about it, KB and KM. KB divided by KB plus M is the fraction of the total stiffness that the bolt contributes, that KB. Okay? Um, and therefore the equation of that line of the bolt load line. So our y equals mx plus c, in this case our y is the, the load in the bolt, equals the gradient of the line, our m, which is our c in this case, times the external load, so our x, plus our intercept, f0. So that equation there is the equation of our bolt load line. Okay, and fb is the force in the bolt, C is the joint factor, fraction of the stiffness due to the bolt, 
FE is the external load. And F0 is the bolt preload. Okay, and typically we're aiming for approximately 20 to 25% is what we try and make the bolt stiffness relative to the material stiffness. Okay, so how do we find these stiffnesses? Okay, so let's think of the, let's just look at the bolt on its own here. Okay, so it's stressed at some point here is the nut. It's this spring here. And what we know is Young's modulus E there, this, the, the Young's modulus of the material E equals the stress over the strain. Um, and the stress is the force over the area. And then the strain is the deflection of the original length. And we can rearrange that to get our FL over our sigma A. We also, and again, we now rearrange this whole equation. We can say that the force F equals um, E A over L times the deflection. And for a spring, our equation, the force in the spring is spring stiffness times deflection. Well, we compare that with this, we can see that the stiffness equals Young's modulus times the cross-sectional area, um, effective area, over the length. And the length of the spring is not necessarily the length of the bolt. It's this so-called um, grip length, or LM that distance where the bolt is on the material, so LM, we call that the grip length. So that's the stiffness of the bolt. Now for the material, uh, let's, go, let's go down here actually for the material. Okay, so for, that's the bolt. So for the material that's being clamped, we now redraw the situation here. What happens is it's being compressed. There's no clearly defined boundary for this compression, but um, stress analysis and um, by various means, there's, they've found that you can approximate the stress distribution inside this by this thing called a frustra. F R U S T U A. Frustra. Frustrum. Frustra. Um, frustrum is the singular, frustra for the plural. So this shape it turns out if you look at it we've got a couple of diameters here that matter we've got a diameter of the hole in the middle here is our nominal diameter d1 is the nominal diameter we've got d2 which is the top of this frustrum here we call that d2 and we know that from our bolt specs that d2 is basically one and a half times D1. And then we've got this final diameter here, D3. And the approximation on these things turns out to be that this frustrum is about 30 degree kind of cone. Think of this as a, a three dimensional rotation here um, around the center line of the bolt. That diameter D3, if you do a bit of trig on the tangents here, um, turns out to be D2 plus the tangent of 30 degrees, 0.58, times the length of the the grip length, L, M. Um, 
And so when you work that out and do your trig, and that's the equation you end up with there. So that's basically 1.5 D1 plus 0.58 LM. So with these three diameters, we can then work out um, this like an approximate area. We can replace this frustrum with a cylinder, and that cylinder is the area of the material that we're going to use. It's going to be pi d squared over 4, so pi over 4 times the external diameter, and we take that to be the average of d2 and d3. So d2 plus d3 over 2 squared minus the inside diameter um, d1. So that's d1, sorry. And that gives us an effective area that we can use for the spring, if you will. For the uh, the clamped material and then it's just the same as the bolt we can we can say that the stiffness of the material is the Young's modulus of the material times the area of the material over the length of the material this is assuming that both pieces of material clamped together are the same Young's modulus um, and this and uh, are clamped um, the same if they're different materials and their joint is at a different point then you have to do a little bit more work to find the equivalent area and the equivalent stiffness you have to treat the two materials as two separate springs and then because they are in series you have to add them as as inverse so springs in series just for from memory and one oh um, the total spring stiffness is one over the springs in series all inverted and springs in parallel you can simply add them together okay but um, so there's a little bit more work involved if these are different materials and different thicknesses but for most of this course we're just going to consider the same material there's other issues when you have dissimilar materials obviously when you clamp dissimilar materials together as well becomes a problem so what we've done on this slide is we've showed you how to calculate the stiffness of the two springs that make up this bolted joint and occasionally there'll be washers in there and and if you go into Shigley, they go into some considerable detail on doing this. This is all ultimately kind of an approximation, so I don't get too hung up on that. As long as you get the bolt and the clamp material um, and make some allowance for, for washers, you're usually um, good to go. All right, so back to the original problem here. Um, we've got the stiffnesses. So let's do an example on see how this all um, pulls together. Centered here. Sorry. Okay, so let's do an example. Okay, so let's think of a, a bolted joint. Imagine a bolted joint here. So imagine this, it's clamping um, together and it, this, this is the, the cross-sectional view of the situation that we have which is this kind of a dome effect here and we've got 10 bolts going around this dome that are holding this lid down effectively. And we'll say that this dome in here, eight inch diameter, okay, and gets pressurized up to say 200 psi. So what you've got is we we, we take a section of this here. This is the situation that we have. And so let's call this piece here, um, the, the material of this thing is cast iron. So this, the whole thing is cast iron. It's a cast iron pressure vessel effectively. And this is a steel bolt. Um, and we'll say it's a half inch 
grade 5 bolt and we'll call it UNC as well okay so it's two inches that's clamped um, and there's ten of these bolts and the preload We're going to say is ten thousand pounds for this for this example, and what we want to know is what is the load on the bolts when pressure goes to two hundred psi in vessel. Okay, so we can work out what that force is pretty quickly. So the force, the external force, is going to be the area, the projected area, so the pi d squared over 4 times the pressure. Okay, so in this case we've got pi 8 squared over 4 times 200 psi, and I'm assuming um, this is psi gauge, not, ab uh, not absolute. So we can work that out. Um, 64 divided by 4 times pi times 200. So that gives us a load of 10,053 pounds. So there's a good 5 tons um, trying to blow the lid off this pressure vessel. Okay, so there are 10 bolts. So therefore, um, we're going to sp split the load up um, into 10. So it's really tempting at this point to say, oh, there's a preload of 10,000 pounds. There's a 10,000 pound external load. So we can divide that by 10, gives us 1,000, just add that and say 10,100 pounds. Okay, but that would not take account of the fact that there is a preload and, it's, and the material is being released. So that would be the wrong answer. So the way we have to do this is we're going to find the... Um, the stiffnesses. So for the bolt, let's start with the uh, the bolt stiffness. So for steel, um, and I should have given you this information already. For steel, we are going to use the Young's modulus of thirty times ten to the six psi. The area is going to be the tensile area, and that's where you've got to go to table 8.2 in your book for half inch UNC grade 5, and we get an area of 0 0.1599 inch squared. So that's where that comes from. And then the clamp length is not the length of the bolt. The bolt's going to be longer than two, in, two inches because it has to go all the way through. But we're going to use the clamp length, which is our two inches. So when we work that out, we end up with uh, about 2.4 times 10 to the 6 as the stiffness. That's pounds per inch. Okay, so that's your bolt stiffness, KB. So next we've got to go and find the material. And we, first of all we need to find the area. So now the area is going to be um, that pi over 4 times the d2 plus the d3 over 2 squared minus d1 squared. So our D1 is the nominal half inch, um, these are half inch yet, so it's a half inch. D2 is 1.5 times that, so 0 0.75. And then D3 is D2 plus the tangent 38 times the length, 2 inches, so D3 comes out to be 1.91. So we have our three 
So we can plug in here our area, throw all those numbers in, and that comes out to be 1.19 inch squared. So you can see the area of the clamp material is quite a bit more than the area of the, um, the bolt. Um, but the stiffness of cast iron, which wasn't given in the, in the question, but um, so now we can do the stiffness for the material, EA over L. So the E for cast iron is 12 times 10 to the 6 psi, so that should have been given in the, uh, in the problem. So that's the E for cast iron. The area we just calculated is the 1.19 and the length is the clamp length is exactly the same. So this comes out to be 7.14 times 10 to the 6 um, inch per pound. Uh, right, so now we can go on and find our joint factor, C. So it's the fraction of the total stiffness that the bolt makes up. So it's our 2.4 over our 2.4 plus 7.14 comes out to be 0 0.251, which is kind of where we want it to be, about 25%. So now the equation of our bolt, our load, our force in our bolt, um, FB equals C times the external load plus F naught. And we have our C is our 0.251. Our external load is the 1,000 pounds, um, so it's our 1,005 pounds per bolt, make sure you do that per bolt, plus our um, preload which is £10,000 and that gives us the answer of 0.251 times 105 plus 10,252. So that's the, the actual force in the bolt. So it's only gone up, um, even though we put an extra £1,000 on each bolt, um, the bolt only sees £250 of that um, £1,000 that it would otherwise have seen. And so that's good for fatigue. Um, that actual variable force that we're seeing is a much smaller amount. Okay. Um, some other things to consider here is um, what about when will it start to leak? Okay, so when will joint separate? And link, and leak, sorry. Okay, so we remember our equation of our line is C F E plus F naught. Now, when it leaks, the external force, if you remember, becomes equal to the bolt force. Um, if you go back to that graph, go back to the graph here. Um, we go back to our graph. So, at the point that it leaks here, it suddenly FB becomes equal to FE and then it, we have the, all the bolt taking all of the load. So for leaking, the, the key is to know that FE equals FB. So we can rearrange this, set FB equal to FE, and rearrange this formula, and we end up with the external load equals F0 over 1 minus C. So when that happens, we're going to have joint separation and leaking. So in this case, we're going to have our 10,000 pound preload of our 1 minus 0.251 is going to give us an external load of 13,351 
pounds. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of PSI? Well, that's the external load per bolt. The total external load would equal 10 times that, which would be 133,351 pounds. And if we divide that by the area, that would correspond to a pressure of 2,653 PSI, so it's a pretty substantial pressure, um, but that's where you'd have a problem with leaking occurring. Okay, so good to know. And then some more things to consider in this example. Um, the uh, torque, again looking at your notes, torque for non-permanent, like that's the whole point of these bolts, so usually the one we use is the preload would typically be 75% of the proof load and so for this case um, the proof load is going to equal the proof stress times the tensile area And this we're going to get from table 8.9, this we're going to get from table 8.2, and in this particular example um, the proof load turns out to be 85,000 kpsi, and the tensile area we've already found. So the proof load in this case comes out to be 10,019.09 kpsi. So that's the proof load. Um, <coughs> so for our preload, we would, uh, sorry, I've got that wrong. Um, apologies. That When you work that out, that comes out to be 13.6. KPSI, sorry. Then our F0 is 75% of that, and so that comes out to be 10.19 KPSI, which is why we set it to 10,000 PSI um, in this example with a 10,000 pound preload. Sorry, got my units. What a mess. Okay, so our proof load is our um, proof stress times our tensile area. Proof um, uh, stress in this case from table 8.9 is 85,000 kpsi. The area is 0.1599 inches squared. Multiply those two together, giving me a proof load of 13.6 thousand pounds. Okay, so that's pounds. And then the uh, preload is 75% of that, so it's 10.19 times 10 to the 3 pounds. So keep, uh, get that right. 10.19 times 10 to the 3 pounds is the proof load, which is what they gave us in the problems, 10,000 pounds, as, as near as possible. Okay, um, one other thing to mention before we end this example is well, how do you get that proof load? Well, we torque up the bolts and the torque that we actually use is, and again, it's an approximation from um, power screw theory, which we haven't done, but it works out to be this. That's your nominal diameter. Um, this here is the preload. And so you can work out the the pre-torque or the, the 
torque that we required to give us that load and in this case it's going to be that uh, preload 10.19 times 10 to the 3 times 0.2 times a half um, so about 10,000 right? times 10 to 3 times 0.2 times a half and that comes out to be One thousand inch pounds. Uh, divide that by twelve. Gives me about eighty three foot pounds of torque. So that's the the torque that we would actually put on this um, joint before we we actually um, applied any external load. One more thing to be aware of um, when you do this is the material clamping that we did was based on, so if we go back to the actual clamping frustrum, we have to make sure that the material is available. So when we do this frustrum, the idea is that the frustrum comes out here and comes back here well if our material isn't available so this thing is too near the edge then there's no frustrum here okay so you have to have material available otherwise we just use the smaller cylinder so we would use the effective cylinder would be this cylinder here. So you use the smaller cylinder for the material area. So again for your material equals E A M over L. This A now would be that smaller cylinder. So if you put the bolts too close to the edge of your flange, then you can get the frustrum in. So you can do the frustrum calculation and you have to use a smaller cylinder, which means your bolt stiffness will be a lower fraction of the overall joint stiffness and you won't get all the benefits of preloading in your fatigue calculations. Okay. So hopefully that's kind of covered that example um, and you're now in a position to, to do preloading of bolts with a little bit more authority. Again, most of the stuff that I didn't hear is already in the PowerPoint notes um, and we will leave it there for now. Good luck.